to this day. Things seem to calm down in the desert for a few months. Well, we'll skip over a few uneventful field ops and go forward to March. It was still miserably cold, and the wind still chilled us to the bone. But the sun stayed in the sky just a little bit longer with each passing day. I just spent the rest of my Sunday packing and getting ready for an excruciating week-long field op. I'd become quite knowledgeable of all the ranges by now, each of them having their own story. Usually they brief us on what we'll be doing. But this field up was extremely tactical and our objectives depended on many different things. So I really didn't have a clue on what we were doing. The first day, we drove out to some random compound with four walls. We dropped our packs and we waited there to get picked up by tracked vehicles. AAVs. All day. And mostly we slept. When the night hit, a terrible sandstorm engulfed us. You couldn't open your eyes for more than a few seconds. If you did, you could only see for a few feet in front of you. It was equally as amazing as it was terrifying. Around midnight, the track vehicle showed up and we piled inside gratefully. We expected we'd go somewhere, but we ended up just sitting there for a few hours before we abruptly started driving in an unknown direction for about two hours. And then we stopped. We waited for what felt like an eternity. We weren't allowed out because the justification was that we could be notionally shot and put out of their little war game. Oof, awesome. Finally, after about ten hours, we were allowed to relieve ourselves and grab food out of our packs. We only got a few minutes and it was dark outside, so that means I'd just spent an entire day inside a vehicle. But at least the sandstorm had died down. A few hours passed by. I can't sleep sitting down on a tiny bench with 16 marines cramped into a vehicle meant for 12. Everyone else is asleep except for one of the crewmen on radio watch. Suddenly, I hear a knock on the back hatch. It was clear as day. I nudge a few guys close by to get them to open the hatch. But most of them tell me to fuck off and go back to sleep. I play the clueless card and put my head down, hoping that whoever knocked would just go away. The knocking continues for about 30 more seconds, and then it stops. Who the hell would be knocking anyway? We have radios for a reason. I spend the next few hours falling in and out of sleep before someone wakes us up and tells us we have five minutes to stretch and piss. I have no idea what time it is or where I am. We all pour out of our tin can prison and spread out. There are other vehicles around us, but none of the marines are out. I head over a dune to take a leak, and take a few seconds to admire the stars. Ooh, a sight for sore eyes. Somewhere in front of me, I see a dark figure off in the distance. There were no AAVs over there, and we were arguably in the middle of nowhere. As they get closer, I see that it's a marine, but I can't make out who it is exactly. They aren't wearing a flak jacket or a Kevlar, just some ragged desert camis and a boonie. That's not allowed on this field op. He gets closer, and I recognize a familiar, dead gaze that doesn't reflect any light. He looks very different this time. A different body, I guess. Don't talk to him. Don't even look at him. Jeez, I already broke one of those rules. So I started sprinting for the AAV. I tell everyone to get the fuck inside with enough fear in my voice to get them going. I grab my radio and get in contact with that same lieutenant. Surely he would understand. He was the platoon commander for the platoon I was attached to. So I called him up on the radio. PBR Street Gang, this is Vehicle 6. There's a Sergeant Wright in our perimeter. Roger. Solid copy, Vehicle 6. PBR Street Gang out. I overhear a bunch of radio chatter coming from the crew compartment. Twenty seconds later, the vehicles start up and we're driving away into the desert for safer lands. Suddenly, we come to a grinding halt. People and gear go flying about. 
I can feel the vehicle turn around and drive the way we came. What the fuck? One of the crewmen ducks down from his turret and informs us one of the vehicles flipped where we were just at. And it was on fire. We were going back to help. Luckily, the Marines had gotten out just as it flipped. We were already packed to the brim, but we managed to make room for four more Marines. All of them were pretty banged up. We drove off, and I'm assuming someone was called to deal with a burning AAV. There wasn't much we could do with a single fire extinguisher we had in the passenger compartment. Someone asked one of the guys what the hell happened to the AAV, and his response was that they heard a knocking on the hatch. They were told not to open it, and a few seconds later, the engine turned on, and the whole thing flipped without even moving. Suddenly, a fire broke out, and they all managed to scramble out before things got worse. This is not the first time this has happened. Yeah, if you Google 29 Palms AAV accident, you'll see a ton of articles. It's an extremely common thing, and most of them don't make the news unless someone gets hurt. We spend the next few hours driving somewhere unknown. I had no clue where we were, but I could tell the terrain had a lot more hills and ditches by the number of times I'd banged my head. <laughs> We'd gotten word that we were preparing for some big attack on a small town. So, we spend the next 18 hours locked up in the tin can, occasionally moving short distances. The bad thing was that there was a fuel leak somewhere inside. All I could smell and taste was fuel. It was pretty terrible. We slept a lot, which made sense because we were being poisoned. Eventually, we'd stopped just outside a town we were tasked with clearing. The ramp dropped and we stumbled out. The sun was bright and I felt blind. A few guys tripped because they were so lightheaded from the fumes, but I managed to keep my balance and started to run for cover behind a tank. A few other assault men followed me, and well, it was a terrible decision. Standing behind a tank is like standing behind a jet engine because of the heat coming from the exhaust. They quite literally burn jet fuel, JP-8. I was the only one in the huge cone of heat for maybe a second before I ran around the tank and sprinted towards the town, tripping over rocks and coughing up fuel from my lungs. But, well, we made it to the town. Pretty soon, we discovered it was completely empty. Turns out that our enemy had been completely taken out by artillery and aerial assets. Well, notionally, of course. We spent most of the day airing out our lungs and appreciating the sunlight before we got back into the Amtraks and drove to a seemingly empty spot in the desert. As soon as we stepped out, we noticed that things had started to randomly catch on fire. No, this wasn't hell or anything crazy. We'd stumbled upon an area where the white phosphorus shells had been dropped. Being Marines, we were amused by the glorious fire rocks and began to kick them at people before we got yelled at. We were told the trucks would come before the sun went down, but we didn't make it back to base until around midnight. We spent all Friday cleaning our weapons, and we didn't get off until 6pm. A friend and I decided that we were going to go to Las Vegas and celebrate modern civilization. To get there, we took the notorious Amboy Road. Well, I've driven it many times before, but to those who don't know about Amboy, it's a two-lane highway that cuts across the middle of the desert. You get the feeling that you are quite literally in the middle of nowhere. There's no cell phone signal for most of the drive. If you crashed, it would likely be an hour or two before an ambulance could get to you. There are plenty of stories about satanic cult members laying down in the road or staging accidents to stop drivers. They ambushed the unsuspecting Good Samaritans and they're never seen again. The golden rule of this road is pretty much that you should never stop. If you see someone on the road, just keep driving. Now that I think about it, there's probably a good reason that I never see any truckers or cops on this road. Anyway, 
The ride to Vegas from base takes about three hours. We hit the road pretty late, and it was particularly windy. Visibility was shit due to the sand blowing all about. I had the great idea of drinking tequila in the passenger seat to make time go by faster. We were about halfway there when my bladder decided that it didn't care about satanic cults, and we had to absolutely stop. We pulled off onto the soft sand, and I opened the door to get out. It was a pretty cloudy night, so there was absolutely zero ambient light. I could see a few feet in front of me because of the car's headlights, but even those were dimmed by the blowing sand. With my eyes half open, I saw something dark dash in the corner of my eye, followed by a yelp and a torrent of curses from my friend. I quickly stumbled back towards the car and saw my friend on the ground face first with something biting his leg violently. All I could see was an extremely dark, lumpy shape. It was like someone had sewed a bunch of different parts of mangy animals together. I froze in fear, unable to make a decision. Before I could move, the thing looked at me with eyes that glowed faintly red and took off down the road. All of this happened in maybe 15 seconds. I got my friend in the back seat and inspected his wound. The only way I could describe the bite, Mark, is that it was the size of a human's bite, but with pointed teeth that were spaced apart. It was bleeding pretty badly, so I did what any marine is taught. I took off my belt and placed it a few inches above the wound to make a makeshift tourniquet. Then I wrapped it in my t-shirt, elevated it, and hoped for the best. He obviously couldn't drive, and I figured I was sober enough to drive the straightest highway in the world. Well, I'm usually extremely against drunk driving, but I wasn't staying around to play with whatever was out there. I helped him hop his way over to the passenger seat, and ran back to the driver's seat. Maybe it was the adrenaline or the tequila, but I was scared as hell. I could barely hold on to the steering wheel because my hands were shaking so badly. I tried to throw in some shitty jokes to lighten the mood, but they were more for myself than for him. At first, I cruised along at a mere 70 miles an hour, that's about 112 kilometers an hour, just to play it safe. But pretty soon, my friend started to quite literally scream in pain. The way he described it was, a million daggers flowing through my fucking bloodstream. I sped up after that and watched the ETA drop slowly on the GPS. My friend was in complete agony the entire time, but I honestly couldn't do a thing for him. I told him to bite the seatbelt, but I knew he was beyond that kind of pain. For about five minutes, he began muttering and slurring his words. It then progressed to something completely incomprehensible. Then, he was quiet, but he still had his eyes open. I sped up to about 90 miles an hour, because I was so worried he was going to die. I was trying to get the signal on my cell phone, when I noticed a bunch of blue and red lights scatter about the inside of the car. Shit. I'm drunk, my license is expired, and I'm speeding. Keep in mind, I haven't seen a cop the entire time I've been on this road. I begin to slow down gradually and look for a good place to pull over. As I'm looking in the mirror, I notice that my friend's radar detector is not going off. That's weird. I'm picturing a billion situations in my head, and all of them end badly. First, I'll get destroyed on the civilian side with a DUI and a ton of fines. Then, I'll get absolutely destroyed by my command. Loss of pay, restriction to my room, and a demotion. Fuck. 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 I keep looking for a good spot to pull over. I round a slight bend in the road and take my eyes off the rearview mirror. The road straightens out and I immediately look back at the rearview mirror. Hmm, nothing yet. I keep driving and glance a few more times. Nothing at all. What the hell? My eyes are locked on the mirror, and I'm waiting for those lights to come around the bend. 
absolutely nothing. Suddenly, my gaze is averted by a flashing orange light in front of me. I slow down even more, and there's a sign in the middle of the road saying, Road Closed, Detour, with an arrow pointing to the left. Granted, this is a straight road, and I'm not going off on some dirt road detour in a Honda Civic, even if it means I can evade the cops. So, I stop right in front of the sign and grab the GPS off the dash. As I'm looking at the different routes, the cop car suddenly comes up literally out of nowhere, and it's behind me now, flashing its lights. Straight up materialized. I look in the mirror, and I don't see anyone in the front seats. I don't see any cops walking towards me, but I am beyond creeped the fuck out at this point, because a mysterious cop car just comes up out of nowhere. My friend is still unconscious and has been bitten by oh, something crazy. Suddenly, all of its lights turn off. I step on the gas and run over this stupid sign in my way. The cop car doesn't follow me. I spend about five minutes going dangerously fast before I start to slow down. Visibility is still shit, but after driving this road enough, you know where all the bends and curves are, thankfully. Up ahead, my headlights reflect off something. I start to slow down, thinking there's another sign to tell me the road is closed. Nope. Off on the side of the road were a bunch of cars, extremely similar in shape to the cop car that was behind me, except it was just a burnt out shell. One car was flipped completely, and another was on its side, both burnt to blackened metal as well. I wondered if that would have been my car if I had stopped for this mysterious car that appears out of nowhere. I never saw another road close sight, and eventually got on a bigger, more frequented highway just outside Prim. At this point, I got service and called 911, who told us that the closest hospital was in Vegas. When we arrived, I went in first and told the situation to the receptionist. They came out with a wheelchair and whisked him away while I sat in the waiting room and filled out some dumb form. All I know is they couldn't stitch up his leg due to the nature of the bite, but cleaned and bandaged the wound. He did eventually wake up a few hours later with some sweet drugs. It was almost five by the time we finally checked into our hotel. He spent the weekend in the hotel while I lone wolfed the city, well, in his honor of course. We both made extremely sure to drive back during the middle of the day. The only weird thing that I could say happened was that the sun was trying to kill us when it was setting. Even with sunglasses on and sun visors down, we couldn't see a damn thing. We had to slam on the brakes after seeing a car driving extremely slow in front of us. Well, eventually, the sun went down and we were treated to hundreds of different colors, constantly changing in complexity and warmth. We didn't see the burned out cars, the signs, or any more cops. However, we did see two cars that had obviously collided head on, pushed to the side of the road. Both front ends were horribly mangled. I didn't see anyone inside, so we kept driving. I honestly don't believe that whatever had bit my friend was a coyote. They're usually extremely skittish and scared of humans. Their bite marks don't match what my friend had either, nor the excruciating pain. It had to be in connection with whatever or whoever was trying to run us off that road. Jeez, so much for a relaxing weekend after the field. I hope you enjoyed that one. Pretty creepy, wasn't it? Well, that'll be it until next week. I'm sure there are more stories in this series coming along. Um, if you're interested, please check out the links to No Sleep because the author has um, included lots of pictures and links to give a bit more evidence to what he's saying. So, please go and check those out. 
Oh, and join me again on Friday when I will return with Dead Man Running Part 4. Yes, finally, it is here. It's on its way, I promise. <laughs> okay, until then, you have sweet dreams, and I'll see you again real soon. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon so come check me out okay <laughs>